Maybe we'll start the office hours over again from right about there. <laughs> so, Stephanie, I, I just don't really have a lot of detailed knowledge on the zeolites. Um, it's a group of minerals. Um, they have some interesting structures. It's the structure of the zeolites that actually makes them interesting economically and uh, that makes their properties valuable. Um, I want to say they're tube-like, but it's 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 not exactly tubes. It's it's something about the um, it, it's a it's a framework silicate mineral. They're in the framework silicates, and I think it's something about the structure of the framework that uh, different size ions get trapped in the zeolite structure more effectively than others. Um, I I have this thing in the back of my mind that some of the the resins that we use to separate um, rare earth elements, for example, in the geochemistry lab when I was in grad school uh, were based on zeolites or, or if not natural zeolites, then were some sort of synthetic uh, type of zeolites. Um, natural zeolites form uh, as a result of relatively low grades of metamorphism. Uh, you find them sometimes associated with um, basalts uh, in in the cavities and the bugs and basalts that grow into those spaces. Um, I've never really lived in an area where the well, <laughs> okay, I shouldn't say I've never lived in an area. I grew up in New Jersey, northern New Jersey. In fact, the the watering basalt probably has some of the world's best zeolites in there, but I was never collecting that stuff when I was young. Um, I think a lot of the zeolites that you see in mineral collections come from places like uh, the, the big flood basalt provinces, India, for example, um, maybe the Pacific Northwest. I, I don't know for sure. The ones that I can remember are mostly zeolite samples that I've seen with India's label on the tray. So that's about as much as I can tell you. Marlon, welcome. Anybody else have any questions? I have one. Go ahead, far away. Uh, I saw somewhere in my Google Plus feed today that the state of New Mexico is expanding at the rate of a an inch every 40 years along the Rio Grande um, Rift. Yeah, sure. Um, that's one of the most active uh, spreading regions of the whole Basin Range province. The Rio Grande Rift is kind of one of the loci of spreading and also the kind of Death Valley region is the other region that's most rapidly spreading. The whole Basin Range province uh, and the Rio Grande Rift is kind of an outlier of that. The Rio Grande Rift is definitely the eastern edge of the the uh, Basin Range Province. The Colorado Plateau kind of sits there in the middle as a relatively undeformed uh, region. And then the Basin Range kind of wraps around the southern edge, so all across southern New Mexico and Arizona, uh, and then up into Nevada and eastern, uh, western Utah. Um, so, yeah, that, that area is spreading um, slowly. It's a continental spreading. Um, I was going to use the term broadly akin to the East African Rift Zone, but broadly is kind of a pun in this case because whereas the East African Rift Zone is fairly well localized along a single rift, uh, the, the Basin Range province in the western U.S. is really spreading over a wide area. It's, not, it's a very diffuse so yeah, this article said. Uh, and, and the Rio Grande Rift is one of the, the focuses of that spreading. Uh, and so, yeah, if you're going to point to any one spot for spreading, yeah, Rio Grande Rift is as good as any. But, but yeah, the, the question I, I had after reading the article is they, they didn't really go into details about how they measure all that. They mentioned, you know, GPS, you know, so like surely you're not going to be able to measure something that's moving an inch every 40 years via GPS. It must be. Yes, you are. You absolutely are. Now, it's not with your handheld GPS device. Right. 
Um, but with high precision GPS units, I didn't realize uh, I got that precise. Okay. And and yeah, in fact, you can get um, you can get millimeter resolution uh, on those on those uh, units now. So your handheld unit will only get down to a few meters. That's really not accurate. What they're actually using there is they've got a um, they got a series of benchmarks. So basically fixed cemented monuments in the ground uh, that are that are moving along with the crust. So I mean if the crust is moving, the monuments are moving. And they are they have surveyed points, um, but the the point is that you basically you can set up the, the GPS unit over one of these benchmarks, center it properly, you know, you use a plumb bob and you center it just like a surveyor would. Uh, and then they have these these rather large, and I gather it's a dish kind of this size. I don't know exactly what size. I've not seen one up close, but it's a, a much more detailed antenna. And what it's picking up is it's picking up a, a much more detailed signal. It usually has, you have to let it sit there for a few minutes so it gets you know an array of these satellites. Um, but with the post processing, not really the the in the field processing, but the post processing. Uh, the Department of Defense puts a scrambler into these signals that reduces their accuracy. They don't want another military using that as a very precise targeting device. And they can actually scramble it even more if you get into a, into a time of war or a region of the world where, they, where they're really concerned about that. But the Department of Defense publishes the scrambling, not the algorithm, but you know exactly what the offset is, so that later on, if you have collected data, you can actually apply it to, you can apply corrections to that and actually get, I think it's at least millimeter accuracy. And so when you're talking about, you know, an inch a year or, you know, modern day plate spreading rates, you know, the Atlantic Ocean, it's about as fast as your fingernails grow. So it's, it's centimeters per year that's within the realm of actually being able to be detected over long timelines by GPS measurements. Um, and, you know, before you had that, surveying was the only other real way of doing that on the ground. Um, and, you know, surveying is, I would say these days, the GPS is probably just as accurate as any sort of, a, you know, laser line surveyor uh, is going to do. Carl, you seem to be muted. I see you talking. I don't hear anything. Doker, are you hearing him? No, I don't hear him either. We can't hear you, Harold. <laughs> Check your microphone setting. We're doing better than last Thursday. Last Thursday, I had crashed by this point. So, <laughs> real hard crash. Blue screen of death and everything. Harold, type if you if you can't. Uh, actually, I can't see. Me. Well, we'll hang around for your thoughts. But um, anyway, uh, the um, yeah. So, so GPS actually is definitely one of the modern ways of measuring plate movements, um, and it, its precision is good enough that you can really get these things down to you know, millimeters, and certainly uh, over long periods of time, easily measure you know, centimeters to meters of, of right. real movement. Um, I trying to think what other means of, of measurement there are. You know, interferometry is generally used for um, measuring elevation changes, although I presume it could be used for, yeah, well, it's, it's also used for ground offsets in the horizontal. Um, Every time there's a major earthquake on a strike slip fault zone, 
usually in the aftermath of that you'll see a big interferogram. So interferometry is satellites and it's, it's using some particular um, radar band and, and I don't know specifically which one this is and it's apparently only one or two of the satellites that are up there that can actually do this and I think it's all European satellites. Uh, but what you basically do is you, you bounce a signal off the Earth's surface, measure the distance, um, and you do this, of course, over a wide area. You get a whole digital elevation model of the Earth. And then you come back on the next pass or a pass in a year or two, and, and you measure the same thing again. And you actually get um, the, the offset. And they usually uh, do that in kind of a uh, rainbow bullseye pattern of colors. Um, and so you can see with satellite interferometry, um, you can actually see very small changes, um, but it's, it's really one of the best things for vertical uplifts um, because uh, it, it's pretty sensitive down to, uh, the vertical is never as precise as the horizontal in GPS, it's just the nature of, of how the satellites are, are spaced and, and how you rate your signal. But, um, you know, certainly you can measure uplifts where it's a few centimeters over time. And, and volcanic uplifts have been the things that have really uh, caught the eye. And that and earthquake offsets. So I, I, I'm used to thinking of it in terms of volcanoes, which is usually a swelling or a deflation of the crust. Right. Um, and sometimes you get these beautiful bullseye patterns right around a, an area of, of uplift. Um, around the Three Sisters area, the Cascades is one of the, the more famous ones of those. Uh, but it's, it's also definitely been applied to strike slip earthquakes. So I, I don't know if that's ever been applied to a rift zone or how you would see that. Um, yeah, I was just surprised it was GPS because I knew the military, like I said, only lets you get so much resolution. And for something moving that small, yeah, I was surprised you could even get that with a yeah, I, I, I'm very sure it's millimeter resolution. Uh, I don't think it's sub-millimeter. A, I don't think you can actually position those things really well. There are some places where they actually have fixed base stations where you just basically screw the antenna onto it each time you want to occupy the thing. So the base station is really well cemented in. But in many cases, they just have a benchmark and they're bringing in a portable unit and they're laying it on top of there. They did this in the aftermath of the Haiti earthquake. They had put in a number of benchmarks at um, on the cement roofs of police stations, yeah. and, and which was actually the most stable, likely to survive the earthquake sort of building that they could find in places where they knew in the aftermath of the earthquake they could get to again. And um, they had these both north and south of the fault line, which was running more or less east west. And um, they had occupied these a few years before. Um, I think spacings of a year intervals, and they had already begun to see that the general creep of those plates, the further away you are from the fault, the, the more the plate motion is just the overall average plate motion, where it's locked up along the fault, of course there's friction there and it's, um, it, it's locked. But when you have the big earthquake, then all of a sudden you get the big offset, and they went back right away afterwards to measure that offset. Part of the, the question is always, well, how much does the actual fault move during the quake, and then how much movement is there in terms of all the aftershocks and the immediate aftermath? So usually they occupy those things as frequently as they can in the months, you know, first of all, a couple of weeks right after a, an earthquake goes, and then um, to months later. And th they get very accurate data. I, again, I, I'm sure, spatially in terms of X, Y, that is latitude, longitude coordinates, you're getting about millimeter accuracy. I don't think the vertical is, is that good. But again, that's just the nature of, of the GPS uh, satellite system. But yeah, it turns out that is the, the most accurate way. I mean, if you look at um, how this was measured before we had the GPS measurements, um, you know, bigger plate motions were the things that were the targets early on. So, for example, the spreading of the Mid-Atlantic Bridge across Iceland all right, was one that um, was one of the first places they went and looked for this. And, of course, you've got the seafloor magnetic anomalies, which 
um, shows you a record that goes back a million years and you know is, is a really great tape recorder for measuring the, the long term motion. Uh, and, and of course in Iceland they had surveyed benchmarks. You know, you put in benchmarks, you survey the distance between them, you do this in a triangulation grid, you, you get really accurate measurements, but when you begin calculating, you know, the, the overall, I don't know if you've seen pictures of Iceland, there's actually the, the original Icelandic parliament is right next to the, the uh, rift. Uh, it, it's, like, it's just like right in the rift valley or, or right adjacent to the rift zone. And so there's a national park there. I, I don't know the full details of it. I've not been there myself, but I've seen lots of pictures. And there's actually a graben structure. You can see the, the, the rifted blocks where there's kind of a gap in the lava flows. Um, but if you measure right across there, you know, year to year, you're not seeing any movement right across that fossil, even though it marks the plate boundary. Uh, because what happens there is the, the stress builds up and then it breaks all in one quake. So you, you get, you know, three decades of, of no movement at all, then an earthquake, and you get, a, you know, a, a meter, well, right. but, you know, a few few centimeters of movement or whatever it actually amounts to, depending on how long the recurrence interval is. But um, it tends to be more episodic right in the fault zone itself. But if you go further away, uh, and the GPS really shows this very well because the GPS basically you get independent measurements anywhere you want on the Earth's surface. There you can actually get the, the kind of steady state movement of the plates. Appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, my pleasure. Robert, welcome. I got an esoteric question for you. Far away. Is it possible with the fault systems in the Southern California area for the San Andreas and everything else like that. Is it possible to have volcanic activity in the Los Angeles Basin? Um, I wouldn't absolutely rule it out. On the other hand, I can tell you with pretty good certainty it's very unlikely. Um, the faults are moving the wrong way in this area. Well, it's not so much that the faults are moving. Well, yeah, okay, in a broad sense, yes. Um, the sorts of plate boundaries that tend to lead to volcanic activity are usually divergent plate boundaries, like you've got the mid-ocean ridges, like you've got Iceland. Uh, convergent plate boundaries, where you've got subduction zones. And uh, in California, the Cascade Range, and up into Washington and Oregon, is one of those. But the Stra San Andreas Fault, the strike slip plate boundary, is just simply sliding side to side. There's actually no compressional or extensional movement, so there's no mass. Mass is basically conserved. It's, it slides along. There's a lot of friction on the fault zone, but that's generally not going to produce volcanism. And I say generally because there are exceptions. Yosemite, uh, Hawaii, and a few other places. Well, there are, I'm saying within the fault zone itself there. Uh, yeah. There are some, uh, for instance, north of San Francisco, you got the Clear Lake Volcanic Field not right on the San Andreas Fault, but close to it, and clearly associated with the San Andreas movement, but not right on the fault zone. Yeah. Uh, and, and I, I was having an argument on this particular subject with somebody else mm -hmm. about the movie Volcano with Tom. Yeah, Cameron. I figured that's where the question was coming from. I'm sitting there pounding my head on, on the keyboard to this guy. I said, dude, I've lived here 30 years. No volcanism in, this, you know, in the area. I now live in San right. Diego. No volcanism out here either, and I live less than three miles from the fault. Yeah, uh -uh, it's a strike slip, as you said. Yeah, you know, that's right. And you know, if, if you want to see volcanism in your lifetime in California, the Mojave Desert has a, a, a realistic chance. There are some young volcanoes out there. Probably a higher chance. Well, the most recent volcanic eruption in California is Mount Lassen, 1914. Uh, uh, is it Shasta in no Shasta's in Shasta's in California, but it has not erupted historically. Uh, at least not recently. Well, I was, uh, no, no. Let's see. The Shasta Rainier. Oh, what's the one that blew up? Uh, St. Lassen. Helens. Yeah, yeah. St. Helens is in Washington, but it's still part of the Cascades. Lassen and Shasta are both active Cascade volcanoes. Lassen is the last one to erupt in California, um, and you know that's historical in terms of its age. Um, there have been a number of eruptions in 
recent geologic periods um, within actually the oral traditions of some of the uh, Indian tribes of Eastern California. Uh, in the uh, Mono Inyo craters uh, basins, you've got some... Okay, up. this is an important phone call. I'll be sure. back in a little bit. No problem. <laughs> I just got launched. Just to complete your your thought, I uh, I read something about the three sisters not that long ago that they're measuring a lot of uh, movement in that area. Are they about to go? Yeah, about to go is a loaded term. <laughs> uh, oh, I'm rooting for them, um, but I I would say you've got a better chance of. Um, well, okay. If we had a thousand year time frame, I'd feel very comfortable in saying, yeah, they're probably going to go pretty soon. Uh, I think the last eruption in the Three Sisters area was, uh, I think there were three consecutive eruptions about a hundred years apart. Uh, I think 1400, 1500, 1600 years ago, or maybe it's 16, 17, 1800 years ago. Uh, so, you know, less than 2,000 years ago, there have been some eruptions in that area, very fresh young lava flows. If you go up to the Santiam Pass, um, the d -Ray Volcano Observatory, there's actually a really nice thing built out of the lava blocks. Okay. Um, and, and if you go to the Mount Bachelor Ski Area or that area south of the Sisters, uh, there are some young lava domes in there that are clearly, you know, no more than a few thousand years old. Um, but, you know, is it going to happen in our lifetime? It could, but um, I'm, I'm not as enthusiastic as I was when they first announced that uplift about a decade ago. Because um, it looks like that uplift is a relatively deep intrusion of magma, not necessarily shallow and not necessarily progressing anymore. Um, you know, if you're going to bet on volcanic activity in the Cascades, um, renewed activity at Mount St. Helens is probably your best bet. Because, um, A, it's already happened once in our lifetime. I mean, the 1983-86 eruption sequence basically quieted down at 86, and then it picked up again in 2004 through 2008. Uh, again, not much in the way of explosive eruptions there, but it was definitely renewed dome growth. Um, Mount Baker has an active uh, set of um, fumaroles near the summit, so it's it's got some life in it, although no historical eruptions to my knowledge. Uh, Hood, actually, right outside Portland, is a, is a candidate for uh, an eruption although I wouldn't hold my breath on that. Rainier actually poses a, maybe the biggest threat to populated areas, but not so much from an eruption as from lahars and mud flows. I heard that. Um, and that's not even necessarily triggered by an eruption. That could just be, you know, weathering and, uh, you know, earthquake, you know, triggering. And there are a number of things that could trigger that, but... Um, that's certainly the biggest threat in a large scale. Um, and, you know, all, all the way down the chain, Lass interrupted in 1914. No reason it couldn't erupt again. Um, Shasta, I don't know how recently it's erupted, but it's certainly a live one. Crater Lake hasn't erupted for a few thousand years now, but it had a big eruption 7,000 years ago. So I've actually visited Crater Lake. It's in... It's hard to imagine something that size going off when you read it. It's gorgeous. Yeah, that, that's a lovely, lovely place. I've just been looking at a bunch of giga pans of it. Yeah. It's, it's a pretty spectacular uh, edifice. And, yeah, it would have been a pretty neat mountain ahead of, well, before the eruption. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I, and, you know, there's enough of these other um, – in the Mojave Desert has enough cinder cones – uh, the SEMA volcanic field up by um, Ridgecrest, north of Ridgecrest. Uh, the the Mono Inyo craters up by Mammoth Lakes. Uh, all those clearly have 
young active magma systems underneath them. They're not subduction related per se. They're kind of based in a range extension related. And the Mojave Desert, likewise, you know, Amboy Crater out there is is not that old, uh, although all those are prehistoric. Uh, and even Death Valley, there are some minor cinder cones. Actually, there was just a story. Uh, I was just reading it before the uh, thing, uh, before we started this thing, uh, about a recent study, in fact, a study just published today, I guess, on um, dating of the Yubihibi crater in Death Valley. Okay. Have you been up there? No. Kind of at the north end of the park, and unless you drive the length of the valley, you probably don't see it. But it's a pretty spectacular crater. It's a, it's a volcanic mar deposit, which is basically the sort of, it leaves a crater behind, and mostly what it does is it spits out um, a lot of steam. It's basically when you get a, a shallow magma body that hits the groundwater table, blows off some steam, blasts a bunch of material out, some of it juvenile, but most of it just you know, pre-existing sediments, sedimentary rocks. And then uh, usually dies down before it gets to any sort of stage where it's erupting a lava flow. Uh, and actually, they were they were looking at the data on that, and they knew it was post uh, Native American settlements because there are some places where the, those deposits sit on top of you know, pottery sherds or something like that. Um, but they thought it was about eight thousand years old. It looks now like it could be as young as let's say 800 years old, um, and more likely that there was a stage of activity around 1,200 years ago, something like that. I, the, I read the, the uh, abstract just before this, and it sounded like the dates that it got were pretty scattered. Uh, there are actually like 12 coalescing craters there of different sizes, so it's possible that you actually had drawn out activity over a few centuries. Um, so, you know, you could get one of those sort of one-off sort of things that would happen, and I, I don't know how much warning you would have. There have been a number of seismic swarms in the uh, in the SEMA volcanic field, SEMA or COSO, the COSO volcanic field. Um, you know, they got a hydrothermal plant in there. Up the geysers, they got a hydrothermal plant. Long Valley's got a hydrothermal plant. All these have, you know, relatively young, shallow magma systems. So, um, guessing which one's going to go next is, you know, it's like picking a lottery. <laughs> sure. They're all capable of it, and I'd love to see one in my lifetime. I mean, Nevada's got capabilities as well. There's a number of young volcanic events out there in the middle of Nevada, and um, New Mexico has, uh, you know, the Valles Caldera, which is certainly capable of producing eruptions too, and there's Yellowstone up there too. And yeah, all the possibilities, and yet all the actions in Alaska and Hawaii. <laughs> That's true. Which I, I have to say, I've been fortunate to see the Hawaiian eruption up close, so that's um, I shouldn't complain too much. I'd like to be able to do something like that. It's a it's a really neat thing to to be able to do. Um, it's one of those those life experiences that every geologist kind of puts on the list. And now, will they uh, let tourists close, or were you doing it as part of a research project? Or yes and no. I was doing it as a tourist. I was not there under any special research uh, grant. There are off limits areas. Uh, the current eruption on Hawaii is more or less in a backcountry area, the, the main event, the Pu'u'u'u event. And Pu'u'u'u itself, the, the cinder cone, is pretty much off limits because it's relatively unstable. The, the, the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory geologists go out there and monitor instruments. They helicopter in at least once a week. So they, they are on it fairly frequently. And you know, when a new eruption occurs, very often there's a videographer or two who go out there and, you know, try and get up close to it. Um, usually, though, in Hawaii, when you do get a well-established set of lava flows, uh, they can come out onto the coastal plain. And uh, in that sort of situation, uh, you can usually walk right up to the lava. In fact, they usually have 
a path and a trail and a parking area so that you can approach it safely. Now, uh, there are areas that are often roped off. You have to use common sense, but if you wanted to, you know, do something stupid, <laughs> there's not somebody there that's going to physically force you not to. Okay. Um, you, you could probably, yeah, I mean, I certainly wouldn't want to be the ranger responsible for telling you not. <laughs> most, most people have the common sense, well, <laughs> most people, <laughs> definitely not all people. <laughs> but, uh, and people do get killed in Hawaii. Uh, and it's not usually from falling into lava. That's, that's one of those things that um, it's possible to do it, but nobody even out of their right mind is likely to end up doing it. Um, the the most recent deaths in Hawaii, to my knowledge, were people that were killed during bench collapses. When you got a lava bench growing out into the ocean along the coast, uh, built on a talus slope, which is very unstable. And as that lava bench continues to grow and add mass, eventually it, it becomes unstable, it breaks off. And then you get kind of that whole interior hot lava exposed immediately to the ocean. You get big boiling explosions, ballistics come, you know, uh, kilometer inland. Wow. And anybody who's, who's stupid enough to be right up close to that thing as it begins to happen, uh, either they can get caught in the bench as it collapses, which is one way to die, or they can be killed by ballistics uh, shooting inland from that. Um, Poison gas? Poison gas is definitely another way, and they're usually pretty good about uh, closing off areas where that's a potential. Uh, in fact, this is why you can't go right up to the, the newest vent uh, right up at the summit uh, on Kilauea. They, they closed off the chain of Craters Road, the, uh, the parking area right next to the Holly Mau Mau vent, uh, in part because of the gases, and, and it's carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide. Most of the time, they're not a problem in that location because you've got enough wind going through there. But they're definitely um, killers in other areas. In, in Africa, um, there are a number of areas on the East African Rift Zone where you get carbon dioxide accumulating in closed basins, closed little um, valleys. Oh. And, yeah, and they actually have a, a name for it. I forget. Uh, it's it's a... The, I know what you mean. word for it, but basically you, you wander into these things, and you asphyxiate. You, you're overcome by the carbon dioxide. It's completely invisible. You wouldn't know it's there. Uh, and all of a sudden, you're gasping for breath, and unless you get out real quickly, you're... Or have an oxygen supply system with you. That, of course, is another alternative. Yeah, there was uh, uh, one lake in Africa that's near a volcano. I don't remember which one. Yeah, Lake Nios is another one you probably heard of. Yeah, it was uh, like they said, don't disturb the lake bed bottom. It's full exactly. of carbon yeah, Lake, lake Nios, uh, I forget when its eruption was, and that was an eruption where it was basically an overturn of the bottom of the lake, releasing a great, great amount of carbon dioxide, which then flowed down the slopes, much like a pyroclastic flow or a lava flow, but it's just dense carbon dioxide. And again, it asphyxiated people that were in the valleys, people up on hills, we're okay, survived it just fine, but uh, people in their villages just you know, know where to run. Yeah. yeah, I heard one somebody who wanted to say, well, why don't they just drop a bomb and seal the vent? And I'm sitting there going, well, you can't do that. They don't well, make it that big. You know, um, you can try doing that. It's been tried. <laughs> Not so much the vent itself, but there have been a number of situations. Hey, the U.S. Army has actually tried doing this uh, in Hawaii uh, with possible success, although it was ambiguous because the eruption stopped just about the time they were trying it, so it, it stopped naturally. Where they were trying to do this, what they were trying to do was uh, bomb the lava flow itself to either divert it or to block it. And this is actually something, I mean, you, you can actually use bombing in support of natural geologic processes to exacerbate them. So um, you, can't mean, bomb, you, you really you can't bomb, bomb an airplane or slam Yeah, 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 literally, literally 
Exactly that. So in in, um, in Italy, uh, Mount Etna, where you commonly have long lava flows, Hawaiian style sort of lava flows, where they're t channelized and in, in, in a tube, lava tube. Um, if you get a long sustained lava tube like this and it's encroaching on civilization, um, they have attempted to bombing is really not the most effective thing. What they've attempted to do is actually dump Jersey barriers. You know what a Jersey barrier is, right? Gabriel. Yeah, basically uh, your big cement block in the middle of the median of the interstate. They they helicopter those things in. They drop them into a uh, a skylight in the lava tube, and the idea is to try and get something in there that's big enough that it might get jammed and clog the lava tube. And then, if it if lava stops and sits for a while, it'll actually cool and solidify, and you may actually block off that lava tube. So, it's not entirely beyond the realm of human. I possible. remember in seventy three, seventy four, the Icelandic uh, eruption. They're sitting out there with fire hoses, going, "Cool yep. off, go that way, go that way, go that yeah. way." And that they, they were, that's probably the most successful uh, defense from a lava flow that, that's documented. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, they were fortunate also that the eruption stopped when it did because, you know. It was, it was a really bad uh, volcanic event as things go. Not yeah. quite a Krakatoa, but uh, for the people living there, pretty yeah, darn well, bad. When, when it, when it, uh, Lights up in your backyard. <laughs> Not a whole long way to run. <laughs> yeah, I remember the old story from Mexico. Uh, yes, the farmer's field. Farmer's Part field. Fa father, you know, the farmer prays to God for a less boring day, and then one day he finds a smoking crack in his field and goes. You get yeah, all kinds of legends attached to that, but yeah, I mean, the, the basic story is is absolutely true. Oh yeah. I forget, it's 1943 or 44 that it begins, but that's part of your team. Yeah. Well, I went, uh, I went to Citrus College here in California, and I don't remember the professor's name, but he did a lot of, he was a really big geology teacher in the field. I don't remember his name, like I said. I think Cerritos, with, did you say? No, begins with an E. No, Citrus. Oh, Citrus. I, I wasn't positive about that. I didn't know of their being at Citrus College. No, Citrus no. Community College. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, in Glendora these days, but back then it was in Azusa. Mm -hmm. Don't ask me how that happened, but <laughs> okay. but my mom who worked there was good friends with him, and he was like, when we lived in Claremont, you know, I said, eh, earthquake, who cares? I live on top of an alluvial fan. I've got enough ball bearings underneath there to. <laughs> you know, yeah, although if they're if they're water saturated, mostly alluvial fan in California, not particularly water saturated, but. Loose sediment is actually going to tend to amplify shaking. Uh, bedrock is actually a better thing to be sitting on, depending on you know how close you are to the quake. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, we, we, I was in when I was living in Claremont. I was pretty close to some of them. Uh, there was one they called the Uplink Quake. Buzz, wrong, wrong county, wrong city. It was actually in Claremont, about 200 yards from where I was. Eh, barely felt it. Trash downtown Claremont. Yeah. Because the alluvial fan didn't move with the bit with the uh, plate, because mm -hmm. the way the sh you know there's lots there's a big pile of gravel, and then a, about a thousand feet of other material on top, yep. and you know you know to your question of things. whether a volcano could occur in a Hollywood style manner, a La Brea tar pits, which is where they located it, would have nothing to do. with any location of an eruption. You know, I've been to the tar pits many a time and asked that question. Yeah, right? I'm sure they get very sick of that. Um, well, well, now they do, but back then it was a legitimate question. Yeah, I mean, two completely different processes there. But, um, you know, to have a, a hotspot volcano um, show up, hotspot volcanoes, which is the style of volcanism that they were showing in the movie, um, could theoretically get started up just about anywhere. Right. Uh, I, I would not say, you know, the L.A. Basin is a very likely candidate for that. But um, there was at least some degree of plausibility to that 
if you're willing to send, suspend disbelief. It was a terrible, terrible movie. And as far as volcano movies that came out that summer goes, Dante's Peak is a much better movie and a much better geological movie. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've been studying military history since I was about 13. I'm mm -hmm. almost 50 now. So, I, you know, when I go in to see a war movie, take my word, World War II movie, I mean, it's like uh, Civil War first, you know, the rest of them. It's sitting there. Uh -uh. <laughs> you know, I, I, my parents dreaded taking me to war movies <laughs> after a while. I got an interesting war tie-in for you with volcanoes. Um, did you... Um, did you know that uh, Iwo Jima mm -hmm. right, out in the Pacific, of course, is a volcanic island. That, that's pretty well established. But Volcanic uh, rock, Matt Suribachi. Yeah, exactly. But the, the beaches themselves, the landing beaches. Black sand. Yeah, are, are, are not just black sand. They're actually now elevated above sea level by, I, I forget what the exact measurement is, but it's something on the order of 10 to 12 feet. Uh, because of, of inflation of the um, magma body underneath the island. Uh, that's a resurgent caldera. And so the the shorelines that the Marines landed on back in, you know, 44, 45, what was it, 44? Anyway, uh, are, are now considerably elevated uh, relative to, to modern-day sea level because of the local swelling of that volcano. Yeah, uh, been tipping in Yellowstone. One lake tipped a little bit and moved and shifted. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Similar, but but definitely a larger magnitude in, in Okinawa or on um, Iwo Jima rather. Yeah. Iwo Jima. Yeah. Iwo Jima was 44. Okinawa and Saipan were 45. Yeah. That makes sense. As a matter of fact, it, I think it's a shame they didn't do it, but. Uh, they have not completely mapped all the tunnels in Egypt. Yeah. I think they should really make an effort, you know, to, to do that because if Suribachi becomes active again, knowing where the weak spots are. Yeah, although uh, a series of human tunnels are not going to have any significant geologic effect on lava flows on anything like that. From an archaeological standpoint, it certainly makes a lot of sense to map them out. It would be nice to know. But from a geological standpoint... Well, if, if realize this, they hollowed out rooms uh, 20, 40, 50 feet offside. Uh, I'm not saying it's completely... You know, it, it, in a volcanic sense, it has weakened the structure of the cinder cone. Yes. But the the magma is not going to see a whole lot. A the size of most of those conduits is not twenty feet. There are rooms in there that are twenty feet. Right. Most of the most of the connecting tunnels are you know big enough for a human to pass through. Lava is going to be able to flow through them for a brief period of time, but it's going to be chilled quickly enough that it's going to basically plug and seal itself. So it's not going to form like a conduit of lava tubes. Oh, no, 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 no. That, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying it's like uh, uh, drilling holes in a support beam. Yeah, although a cinder cone is not a particularly solid thing to begin with, especially when you've got a... a, a is there a, a cinder cone, or is it uh, a shield volcano? I don't remember. Well, okay, in either case, it's not a particularly strong... Uh, thing and under a rising body of magma with the earthquakes that are going to be associated with with the magma movement, um, yeah, you know, it, it's it's nominally weaker. It's a little bit weaker, but it's not going to make a significant any. difference. And, and and I think the other thing is that as tunneled in as they were, I don't know how deep into the mountain those tunnels go because from a geologic standpoint my guess is they're all in the outer couple hundred feet of the mountain you know so it's it's it may be Swiss cheese but it's it's relatively thin veneer of Swiss cheese toward the outside edge of the mountain okay yeah because nobody actually really knows how deep the Japanese dug some of them say hundreds of yards into Suribachi yeah. but you know the, 
they haven't gone. The last special I saw in Sirabachi. Hello, Gina. Hello. They had uh, people going in, <coughs> and they couldn't get as far as they wanted to because they kept running into collapsed tunnels. Yeah. Yeah, or tunnels yeah, that, that, that was my point there about, you know, cinder tunnels are not really, it, it's easy enough to tunnel through in the first place, it's really not the most solid material for long-term architecture. One quick question here. Do volcanoes produce basalt, or is basalt produced by a different process? No, basalt is one of the magma types. Uh, that can well, it's one of the rock types really that uh, can be produced in certain types of volcanoes. Uh, basalt is one end of the compositional spectrum of lavas. Uh, wow. Lavas come in a wide range of compositions. Generally, we we describe the composition of lava as mafic to felsic in the broad chemical sense, where basalts are the mafic end of the spectrum. And basalt is just the actual igneous rock. We often refer to it as a basaltic lava, but basalt is actually the rock that forms from a cooled basaltic lava flow or a naked lava flow. Yeah, and um, it's harder than all get out, too. By, by far the most common type of volcanic rock on the Earth's surface, primarily because it's the, the main uh, rock type in the ocean basins. And if you go to Hawaii-style volcanoes, Iceland, uh, they're almost 100% basalt at the surface. Um, on the other hand, if you go up to the Cascades, um, there is certainly some basalt in there. In fact, it may be 50% basalt overall. But the big volcanoes, the Mount St. Helens, the Mount Rainier, Crater Lake, uh, Mount Shasta, those will have some proportion of basalt, but most of the edifice there is the more felsic end of the spectrum, rocks that come from that end. Yeah. So basalt is one of the things, and, and of course there are also these, if you go up to eastern Washington or around the Columbia River flood basalt, the Stake River Plain, a lot of that is basalt as well. Yeah. So it's pretty common volcanic rock. You also find a lot of volcanic glass called obsidian in that part of the world too. Yeah, and obsidian is really just, um, well, most obsidian tends to be at the more felsic end of the spectrum. There is mafic obsidian, it's pretty rare, but obsidian is defined not so much by its composition as by its texture, the, the fact that it's glassy. Um, and that tends to be more common in the felsic again of the spectrum, uh, even though it's a dark colored rock. Yeah. Yeah. No. Gina, any questions from you, Gina? Nope. I just wanted to know if anybody else is getting into Rockstar from National Geographic. Have you watched it? No, I'm no. not. I don't have cable, so I... Oh. Uh, okay, uh, they've been... The, the past two episodes have been the Niagara Escarpment, and the guys are actually scaling the sides of the, the, um, the, the, the cliff and, and getting the extra rocks off that are hanging there so that they're not a danger to people. Just a fun show. Interesting. Yeah. Well, the Niagara Escarpment is, to the best of my knowledge, is pretty much unstable. The, 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 that's the what? whole point, and that's why <laughs> the last episode they were scaling the the um, right above the Maid of the Mist, and yeah. and some of the rocks actually went down on the um, the platform down there that you actually get onto the boat. So. Yeah. Well, if memory serves, the hydroelectric system in the evening hours sucks as much water out of the Niagara River so that there's like less than 10% of the normal volume through it. And that doesn't allow for a lot of erosion to occur. The only time they put it out on full bore is when the people are out there looking at it. And I think it's only at 50% even then. The rest of it gets channeled off into hydro plants. Right, but I think the erosion's coming naturally with the rain and, and that kind of thing, getting behind the rocks. And, and, and let's, let's also point out, 10% of the, the natural flow over Niagara Falls is still an awful lot of water. <laughs> it, it, does a, it does a fair amount of erosion, even if it's not doing as much as it could. Yeah. Well, here in California, Southern California, we have a rather strange sort of side topic of erosion. 
we don't get a lot of rain here or a lot of freezing temperatures. But when we do, it really just breaks the roads up really fast and really hard. Yeah. The, um, the freeze thaw process is what gives, what really expands those potholes um, mm -hmm. because it gets in there. And freeze thaw is really effective at, at uh, water free, water expands about 9% in volume upon freezing. And so the water sinks into those cracks, and when it freezes, it really pries them apart. So the northeast U.S., of course, has pothole problems every spring because of this. I'm sure Ontario does too, right, Harold? Yeah. Your audio is hey, is it good? Yes, you're doing fine. Anyway, California, of course, drier most of the year, but you get those monsoon seasons, and so you definitely have some water and yeah, some other things. Yeah. yeah. Back well, in the okay. 80s, I remember it was like every night was below freezing, and everybody was waking up <laughs> trying to drive on black ice, and so they're going, yeah. Oh, this crap. Welcome to our winters here in the Northeast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you people know how to handle this. You got a bunch of people from Central and South America. You know, the only place they see nice is in the bar drinks. <laughs> They're probably around in the rental wrecks, and they hit the brakes on a piece of black ice, and they just <laughs> get all out. Yep. You know, it is interesting because um, there is uh, a real correlation here with climate. I, I'm living here in central, well, western Kansas, and it's relatively dry out here. We're not desert conditions, but we're not a whole lot wetter than that. And so, you know, I give that pothole explanation each year about and to the students, and uh, because we don't get as much freezing and thawing here, we do get some. But we don't get nearly as much, and so the potholes are really not as noticeable in this part of the world. Certainly not in the spring when they're really noticeable in the Northeast. Uh, and so I usually give my examples from the Northeast U.S., and usually it's one or two students in class that can really identify with that. <laughs> well, here's, a, here's a hypothetical for you. Mm -hmm. If they were concerned that a volcano was going to blow and do serious damage to human life or what have you, is it possible to do a slant drill on the other side of the volcano away from it and, you know, hit the magma chamber and then the crew runs like heck while it goes spurt out the whole they board? Or so you want the short answer or the long answer? A uh, short answer. No. <laughs> I can answer that in two letters. <laughs> yes. no. The only yeah. solution is to run like hell. <laughs> run. Volcanic, volcanic eruptions are about as unlikely to be influenced in terms of whether or not they're going to happen uh, as, as just about any geologic process. I mean, yeah. I, I, I would almost say we could do more to, well, I won't open that can of water. Well, let's just say that, you know, you're really not going to be able to do anything significant to a volcanic eruption that wants to go. Um, you know, you can, and, and there's obviously evidence of this in the past, do a little bit to divert lava flows. Um, you can, you know, certainly shelter people, get them out of the way. Burn. But there's really nothing you can do to influence the length of the eruption or the amount of material that's going to be erupted. That's that's really entirely, even if you had a pretty unlimited budget, I cannot imagine a way that you would really be able to have any significant geologic influence on that. And dropping a bomb down the main vent doesn't help either. Well, I mean, you know, if you put a big enough bomb down the main vent, you could... Um, Accelerate the process. A lot further, but... Um, yeah, no, the... A, getting the bomb into the vent would be tricky in the first place. And B, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to explode the bomb underground? It, you know, bombs do a lot of destructive in the atmosphere because of the shock waves that come out from them. A bomb exploded underground, I mean, look at the nuclear bomb tests in, in Nevada. You know, they created a, a big open cavity. And then everything collapses down into that. But 
I say a big, big relative to the bomb, not big relative to Nevada. <laughs> yeah. So My grandfather worked so, on Manhattan, so I'm pretty, I'm much more knowledgeable of what a a bomb is and what it can do than your average citizen. Yeah. Well, Mount St. Helens was perfectly happy until that whole side of the mountain slid down and then exposed it to a big blast. So uh, the bomb could have uh, started that five minutes earlier, probably. <laughs> <laughs> with the same result in the with end. The, with the same result. Yeah, one of the things that I... Or maybe blasted the other way. You know, one of the things when I'm talking to people about military weapons and nukes in particular is I said, look, volcanoes, the average out the top explosion of a volcano is bigger than any atom bomb we've ever built. Oh, yeah. The amount of energy. By, by a long stretch. <laughs> you, know, it's, you know, it's like, okay, let's say this lady finger firecracker I've got over here is one explosion. All right, and we got a 10 megaton bomb over here on the other side. In relationship, that little firecracker is our A-bomb, and the nuke over there is the volcano. That's yeah. about the s s size difference of explosions. Same yeah. goes with earthquakes and supermen and all that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to come back to Afghanistan and talking about military uses of geology. Um, one of the things was done early on in the Afghan war while they were chasing bin Laden through Torbor and the, the steeper regions of the Afghan border was an attempt to bomb those caves. You know, they used these bunker buster bombs, you know, and, and they were aiming to basically hit the mouth of the cave and, you know, <laughs> it's like hitting the exhaust port on a Death Star, right? <laughs> 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 it, it, it's a little bit like that. Um, but one of the one of the things that I think they, they they brought in some geologists, they consulted with some geologists about you know what could they do that would be more effective, and one of the things that they came up with was uh, triggering landslides, and uh, you can use bombs to trigger landslides if you've got the right unstable mass of, of rocks, and a landslide will close the mouth of a cave real effectively. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, you're, you're not going to get out of that without some real heavy equipment in there. Uh, so that definitely was, I don't know if it's been documented how effectively, but I know that that, uh, that was a tactic that was used to bomb areas upslope that had potentially unstable materials that could uh, generate landslides. Well, if they really, apparently they didn't take the geologists to heart because... Um, our friend, the B-52, will carry 103 750-pound bombs, and it can drop them all on one spot at the same time. And you can check with the North Vietnamese on that. When those things hit, it does displace a lot of dirt. Yes, dirt is one thing, and, and, and dirt can be moved. You, you can, yes, you can make craters. <laughs> Uh, and, and, you know, if you do this on a steep enough hillside, you can get a lot of rocks moving. But, um, well, they do that for Switzerland and uh, the Alps and Rockies for avalanches, right? You see that on your shows all the time. And on the rock stars these days. <laughs> I, I was talking about National Geographic. I'm sorry. I think you came yeah. in a little bit late, hmm. um, Harold. We were talking about Rockstar National Geographic new show, and that that's part of what they do too. Besides scaling the the sides of the cliffs, they will put dynamite in there and blow it up and and bring down huge amounts of unstable areas. Yeah, you know, there's one TV show, and I don't remember who put it out. I think it was Modern Marvels, that I think every geologist student should see, and that's the building of the Cheyenne Mountain Complex. You know, okay. give the, you know, it, granted it's a military installation, but they dug uh, a three-mile-long tunnel in a solid granite mountain and hollowed it out, hollowed out three large tunnels. And they did it in less than two years. Wow. I visited the small Canadian version of that. That was fun. <laughs> the NORAD one up in North Bay. I was down there. 
Yeah. So, you know. uh, during World War One, sappers from both sides were fighting in tunnels that they dug in this hill, blowing stuff up inside. You know, they spent oh, yeah, they had years, years yeah. tunnel, literally tunnel yes. warfare. Mm -hmm. The crater in the Civil War, which is another yeah. example of this, probably the earliest. Yeah, no, they dug a tunnel under the. It was in Vicksburg, I believe. They dug a tunnel under the. Uh, not Vicksburg, lines. Uh, outside Richmond, um, Petersburg. Petersburg, that's right. They dug a tunnel under the Confederate lines, put in a couple hundred tons of black powder, lit it and ran. Made a big hole in the lines. Yeah. You and and army ran into the crater and said, uh, "How the hell do we get out of this thing?" Uh, <laughs> Oops, forgot the ladders. Yeah, uh, geological formations and terrain is one of the big studies at military academies. I mean, military academies, they pound geology and all sorts of related sciences into your head. Oh, yeah. Modern land warfare requires you to understand what you're sticking where you're hiding because um, if you are in a desert environment and you're hiding in, a, in an arroyo and there's a thunderstorm up in the hills, <laughs> guess where you don't want to be? There, there's another uh, spectacular example of this. Um, and I, I don't remember the details of this, but I, I know the geology of it. I was during the uh, Arab-Israeli conflict in, I think, 67. Um, when the Israelis were up close to the Suez Canal, uh, and the uh, Egyptians, I guess, were uh, running. Well, no, they, they, they were um, they were basically behind a, a sand. Uh, they had they had dug in underneath loose sand. They basically had loose sand. Sand was basically absorbing the energy of all the artillery shells. So an artillery shell comes in, the sand absorbs a lot of the energy because it's just dry sand. Then the Israelis got the bright idea to hose down these hills, these sand hills, and when you get it water saturated, all of a sudden all that energy was much more effectively transferred. So every time you had a bomb drop on that stuff, it actually collapsed, um, you know, the, uh, the uh, whatever the stuff was. We lost our military geologist there. So. <laughs> Anything else, you guys? We, we, we've been going now over an hour, so I'm ready. I'm just always trying to check my sound, that's all. <laughs> no, I just want to say hi yeah. to everyone. I, I'm just going to edit out the first 15 minutes of this one because we had terrible sound to begin yeah. with. Um, but I think I finally got a recording here that if I don't crash it on the uh, editing session. We'll actually have something worth putting up. Okay. Bye. All right. All right. See you later. Have, have a nice good one. Bye-bye. Monday. Take it easy.